Good morning, everyone. Um, we are here and let's see, Wendy, I need to get you around the corner so that I can have you on the screen here and I'll readjust here. There we go. Excellent. Excellent. All right, I've got seven participants. We'll see, we'll give just a few more minutes, maybe one before uh, and then we'll just go ahead and go time is precious and i know there's a lot of meetings that are taking place he's here somewhere here. yeah yep he too <laughs> that sounded like nancy i'm sorry i turned it off good morning nancy good morning <laughs> Okay, again, I know that uh, there's lots of meetings taking place. People can jump on. Um, my mother taught me to be timely, and especially with school bells, uh, we want to make sure that we get ourselves started. So welcome, everyone. You can see that we have some great people here at the OPI. And uh, for this meeting specifically, there'll be others that will be joining us via Zoom. We do have quite a robust agenda at this point. So I'm just going to go ahead and get us started. So I'd like to introduce um, on two and three, uh, Janie Solomon's not able to join us. The Ian's update has to do with our, um, our non-public, our private uh, dollars that have gone out um, to our, oh, I don't, I can't remember how many. I think there were a little bit over 150 different recipients with Ian's one. Ian's two had an opportunity uh, that has just opened and it is a different uh, framework where it's more on um, procurement rather than reimbursement. And I know those are our government, but I've got uh, Wendy Bonds here that I'd like to go ahead and introduce. She is leading our ESSER and our Ian's and um, we need to have the Ian's up. So what we're doing on the Ian's right there we now go. is um, we are moving into working with an organization called FACTS to help us um, work with individuals in the non-public school community, both private and homeschooling entities who wish to utilize the funds for educational purposes. And so we're working very actively with them. We've done a couple of webinars, some open offices with those individuals. We've had some phone calls to try and help them identify what areas of usage they may 
have where their needs are and, and how to help them in that process. So that's been going along pretty smoothly and we'll continue to work with them um, over the next couple of weeks to just secure and use those funds most effectively in their individual settings. Excellent. And just to recall again, as you can see on the blue, that's Ian's one, Ian's two is yellow. You see there were 147 applicants. We did pretty much with the one Ian's one uh, deployment of dollars. We did um, ask again before we reverted the dollars back to the governor's office and wanting to make sure then that the governor has the availability of these funds in multiple ways to be able to use this. And I know we've got Nancy Hall on. Nancy, is there anything you'd like to add on Ian's one or Ian's two as an opportunity? Um, well, I just say that we're working on figuring out how to distribute the Ian's one money, the 6.2 million and OPI has just notified us we'll have another 6 million back from the Ian's two and that's down the road to how we'll distribute that. But we have more opportunity, different opportunities to spend those funds than what OPI, theirs were pretty restricted uh, regulations on that same funding. Thank you, Nancy. Sorry to, sorry to just to put you on the spot there, but it is all about a partnership. And again, between the, the blue deployment of Ian's one and the yellow, two total different guidances that we were given from the federal government. So as Wendy had shared, the opportunity now is having a third party that will procure whatever it is that can be used to aid in education in that non-public world. It's a total different view than how it was with the reimbursement factor and the procurement. So we are, um, we're looking forward to seeing uh, a little bit more than the 59 uh, participants at this point. So if anyone has anything that they can share, I know I did a press release last week to say that uh, the dollars are available and they're here to aid anyone in the advancement of education. All right, so let's go then on to the ESSER. If uh, I can have the, here we go. Jay, let's go ahead and have you share. Okay, so what we have up here, this is a document that I um, put together for the education, um, interim education budget committees. And what it does, it basically gives a breakout for all of the pots of funding that we've received due to coronavirus. Um, the first one here that we have is what we call the ESSER one, which um, came from the, the CARES funding. And so what, it, what it'll show is that there's gonna be two boxes in there, and this is something the superintendent said we can make available. The top section will be what we call the budget. That's gonna represent the total funding that we got for that funding itself. In the top, you can see there where there's a budget begin, budget end date, as well as the tidings. And so for any of the department of education grants, we have one year of period of performance where we can spend and obligate those funds. But department of education also gives us under what they call the tidings amendment, an additional 15 months to spend the money down and actually liquidate it. And so for like this one, the CARES one, you can see under the funding that we got $41 million, um, underneath there, there's a distribution based on Title I formula. Per the Department of Education, we had to make available 90% of that $41 million to be direct, directly distributed to the LEAs. And then the remaining portion of that is what they call a 10% set aside. And that's where for this initial ESSER one where the Office of Public Construction had some discretion and how those funds would actually be utilized. And so each one of those budget sections, you can see down that we also provide you a breakout of that 10% set aside. Uh, for the portion to adjust the minimum, superintendent wanted to make sure that everybody got at least a $10,000 allocation, you know, because the initial 90% was based on the Title I formula, there was quite a few schools that actually were not Title I eligible, so we took that $10,000, made it available to them, and then any other schools that got less than $10,000, we brought them up to that level. And then the district allocation based on related services. And that's a piece that the superintendent want to set aside for specific IDA type related services, kind of like we do with, with IDA. Um, so she also want to make a portion available to the cooperative. So there was some equity there. And so in total of that, we, we set aside $3 million and made that available. And then per the regulations, the Office of Public Construction can retain a half percent for administrative costs. And that's the personal services and operating costs that we expend and incur to administer the program itself. 
And then of that last nine and a half, we still had uh, 309,000 that we utilized for other areas where we had identified where there was a need related to COVID. So Brian, if you could scroll down to the financial activity. Thank you. And so underneath what each one of these pages is also gonna be a financial activity piece. And we here at OPI break it up into two buckets. If you look at that left-hand side, you can see where it says administration. Those are funds that we're retaining here at the SCA level that we're using to administer the program or we're doing some type of direct support to the districts, again, related for those COVID activities. The bottom portion is what we call flow through, and that's that component that actually gets distributed directly out to the LEAs. And so in that flow through, you can see that base, that $37 million, that was the, the minimum that we had to set aside for LEAs. And then of course, that $3 million that we had talked about for related services. And so in these, you can see the administrative for the CARES 1 or ESSER 1, we've expended all of our administrative money and we're about 79% completed through our, um, our, uh, our flow through piece. And this document, actually, we made a payment out on March 10th. So instead of the 8.4, it's actually down just a little bit over $6 million. So there's been some additional movement since then. And I would like to add to this, because this uh, the shelf life of these dollars is pretty much the end of September, which is in six months. We need to make sure that our schools then do draw down that $6 million. And that's at the very first bucket of dollars. And so it's not even reflecting the $154 million or the $300 million. 34 million that also came as the third part of ESSER 2 and ESSER 3. So just a shout out again, that if you're working in schools, please make sure that they have uh, drawn down. If we do not have these dollars expended by schools or have them drawn down, then it follows the same path as we've always done, that if there's a time limit, the money reverts back to the federal government. This money does not go back to the governor's office. It'll go directly to the Department of Education. Let's keep it here in Montana. Let's make sure that we have an opportunity with our schools. So it's a big shout out right now to make sure that um, if you have not, if you're working with schools and ask, have you drawn down your ESSER 1 that came from the CARES Act? Because we're here to serve and we're here to make sure that those dollars do get to students and we're here. Thank you, Jay. Okay, so Brian, if you could scroll down to the next page, please, just the top budget. And so this is the second pod we'll call ESSER 2, otherwise this came from the CARISA Act. And this one's a little bit different because when we received the funding, it was during the legislative session. And so through House Bill 630, the legislature was involved in how we actually made portions of the distributions or how we set aside those funds. And so for the funding, we got $170 million Again, same regulations apply that we have to take 90% of that and make it available to the schools directly. So that's that 153 million, which leaves us a 10% allowable set aside of 17 million. And so again, during through House Bill 630, that 10% was distributed out in different buckets. We've got the school district supplemental 3.4, other educational institutions. That's funding that was set aside for like MSDB, Military Affairs, Pine Hills, some of those other organizations that don't take, typically get some of this grant money. Uh, bucket for special needs, um, targeted school support, uh, Education Leadership Montana, and then the one we've heard a lot about is our database modernization of that 8 million. And then of course, the half percent of administrative funding that we retain here at OPI. So Brian, if you scroll down to the financial activity. Thank you. So again, same format here We're on the left, you can see you've got the administrative component as well as the flow through. So for the admin, you can see that we've started to spend it. We're still about 8%. So we still have quite a bit of funding left for that. Um, the flow through piece of it, um, we're about 26%. And although that seems like it's kind of high or low because it's, you gotta look at the amount of $42 million. Again, that's what they've spent in less than a year. That's you know equal to about some of our larger programs like IDEA and Title I. And so it's still a significant spend when you're talking about $150 million. It's, it's, it takes a while to get that down there. So, so of the program, of the Chris of money in total, we've expended about 25% of those funds. Thank okay. you. And the shelf life on this then extends to another year. So it'll right. be in 23, September, end of September of 23, that all of these dollars need to be spent. And if they're not, then it follows the same path as we did with the CARES $1 which means it will revert back. Right. So Brian, if you could scroll down to page three, please. 
Okay, so this is ESSER 3, and this came from the ARPA Act. And again, during the legislature, we had House Bill 632 that drove how those funds were going to be used. So again, total funding was $382 million. Same formula applies, 90% going to districts is $343 million, which left us, just, left us just a little over $38 million for the 10% set aside. Um, I won't get into detail, but as you can see that the 10% again was broken out similarly with a couple other different areas of, of focus, like the state learning loss of instruction or state loss of instructional time, which is at 19 million. A um, little bit of funding set aside for state summer enrichment after school programs, um, but then also the administrative piece as well. And so this one actually extends out the tidings period through 930 of 2024. So we've got a little bit more time on this one. And if you could scroll down, Brian, please, financial activity. Okay, and so in this one, you can see administrative, we haven't spent any of the money. That's because we're really right now primarily focused or utilizing the, the uh, SR2 money or that CARISA funding. And so we're, we'll still haven't tapped into that pot. The flow through component of it, just a little over $13.5 million has been spent or about 3.9%. And there's a couple other buckets that summer uh, or state summer enrichment, we're actually at 3.8. We're working on the application right now and should hopefully have that open in about the next month or so. And so total for uh, the ESSER three, we're just shy of, we're just a little over three and a half percent for total expended. Um, again, you're still talking $13.6 million, but you're talking of an overall $382 million, which is a pretty substantial bucket, okay? Um, there's, when we provide the document, there's a couple other areas in there that it goes over like the homeless dollars as well as special ed, but um, in light of time, I'm not gonna get too much in detail on that. Really focus here on just the primary ESSER buckets of one, two, and three. Um, but we will make this available at any time anybody has questions they can feel feel free to reach out to me and we can uh, we can talk to this further if needed thank you jay and not only is this these are dollars that are directed specifically to schools uh, but there are other county dollars there is impact aid dollars that go to our sovereign tribes uh, there is there is other dollars that are there for the community effort and one of the things that we have shared with our after school partners um, and even with our summer school that will be deploying here shortly, um, they can directly go to the LEAs or our schools. They can go to communities uh, to see exactly to extend whatever dollars that we might have to gift out at this point. Any questions you might have either of Wendy or of Jay regarding any of the uh, federal dollar deployment? All righty, and a reminder again, all of the documents that we're sharing will go out in an email to everyone, so you'll be getting these digital today. So let's go on to the student mental health. Jay, this is another one of yours that I believe has uh, crossed the finish line after legislation with uh, the uh, previous legislature giving the Office of Public Instruction um, Medicaid dollars for uh, student health. Right, so Brian, if you could pull up that CSCT document, please. There we go. Okay, so again, this is a document that I made available for the interim committees. Um, so for those of you who are not really 100% familiar with the program, during the last legislative session through House Bill 671, the legislature changed the mechanism of how CSCT claims are actually reimbursed. Um, in the past, um, there was what they called a certified public expenditure program that was run through Department of Public Health and Human Services. And through that program, it was that claims could be submitted and reimbursed, that school districts could get their federal portion of that. They didn't have to put up any hard cash, but it was more of a documentation of an in-kind um, in -kind expenditures. Back in 2016, the program itself actually was, was discontinued because the CMS or Medicaid came to the state of Montana and said that the program as designed was not meeting their requirements. And so for uh, the several years moving forward, the Department of Public Health and Human Services uh, went to a different program where they were actually putting up state hard cash dollars to meet the match requirement. And under the Medicaid program, in order to receive the, the two thirds of the Medicaid reimbursement, the state had to put up one third of dollars or around 35% to receive the 65%. Um, through House Bill 671, they changed the mechanism and who the, who's the, was responsible for actually submitting that hard cash. And so that transitioned from the actual state level down to the local district level. And so the, we implemented through again, um, a process called an intergovernmental transfer 
where school districts have to send in, they're notified of what their match requirement is for um, submitted claims. They have to submit to OPI actual hard cash that we verify comes from a non-federal source. And then we actually um, notify DPHHS of which claims they can release. And then the districts actually receive their, their reimbursement, both their match portion of it, as well as the federal piece of it as well. And so going into the intergovernmental transfer, it was we, I'm sorry, back up in House Bill 2, um, during the session, they actually gave OPI $2.2 million of what we call bridge funding. And that money was state dollars that was um, set aside so that we could pay that match obligation during the time frame when DPHHS and OPI were actually coming up and implementing the intergovernmental transfer process. Uh, that bridge funding ended in December of 21. And so February 1st was the first time that districts actually were going to be required to start submitting that hard cash amount. And that would have been for January claims that were submitted. So what I have here in the document is in the month of February in that top under the CSCT claim activity, you can say that we had 47 claims that were submitted. The total value of the claims was just shy of $1.4 million. And the school districts had, to, had submitted uh, $394,000 to receive their federal portion. Um, down below under that, you can see the month again in February, the summary of the claims released that we released 29 claims. Total value of the claims was 992,000, which means the schools actually submitted $280,000. Now, part of the, the timing of this was that as a requirement of CMS in order to receive that federal portion is that they had to have a signed MOU with Department of Public Health and Human Services. So that first month in February, we had um, quite a few schools where their board meetings did not align with the window that we had in order to make those distributions, and which is why you see that there was less claims that were actually released. As we've headed into March, you can see that there was a few more claims, so 50 claims submitted, a um, little higher dollar value, about a million dollars more, so that match liability is about that $675,000. Uh, month of March, we had 41 claims that were submitted and released because we received their match payment. Total value of that again is like 2.4, and the state match was $699,000. And below that, we also provided there's a signed MOU that's the, all of the school districts that have submitted. Um, this actually has one more, or I'm sorry, two more. Since this has actually been uh, presented, we've got 56 MOUs um, altogether. So. Thank you, Jay. So the other thing to add to this is all the dollars that Jay spoke about before those federal COVID dollars. Um, they can be used uh, for this. They use their general fund dollars first, and then the, uh, these ESSER or COVID dollars can replace that general fund. So any of these budgets that, that these schools that you see here at this point um, could be using that. Uh, it could be used for, for any of this, for the mental health that we know that is desperately needed within our schools at this point. The other part is I want to say very much thank you to Department of Health and Human Services. You know, this is a new program for the OPI, and we uh, got it off without a hitch. Um, there was a lot of consternation because I just want to reiterate, it was a soft match before, and now it is a hard dollar match. And I do know that I have Representative Beatty here. I don't want to put you on the spot, Representative, but the OPI and DPHHS have worked diligently in making sure that mental health services, not just continuing in our schools, get, but can be looked at moving forward more robustly. So thank you. All right, uh, any questions on mental health? Let's go into the report card. That was just something that we embargoed. Um, it's something that is demanded of the Every Student Succeed Act is a transparent out to our schools, our families, and um, our taxpayers. It is uh, something that uh, we do annually, and we also annotate um, the uh, where they are within uh, the data as uh, from assessments, as well as to the designation through uh, Every Student Succeed Act. Everything has pretty much been paused. So there is some new things and we do have our expert, Chris Noel. If you would like to share, that'd be fabulous. Thank you. 
Excellent. Thank you, Superintendent. And we also have Brett here. Brett is sharing his screen today. Brett um, and I work together here at the OPI in the data section of the agency. Um, and the report card is a collaborative effort across, as you can imagine, many different parts of our agency, as it is the moment in time where we take every scrap of data that we have collected and cleaned and processed and analyzed and thought about and put it all together in one place, not just for us and for you, but for the public more generally and more broadly. Um, this year, as the superintendent stated, there are a few things that are a little bit special and different. Um, we all know that we have had things that made testing complex and complicated over the last few years. Um, and we know that there are lots of things that have related to attendance and when schools can be open that have been going on. And in honor of that, the federal government has provided us two separate waivers. We had a waiver in 2020 that released us from the obligation to test. And in 2021, the 2020-2021 school year, um, we needed to test, but we had a waiver that essentially released us from responsibilities around the parts of the data set that we couldn't reliably reproduce. So for example, if we need to talk about student growth scores and we don't have any testing data from 2020, it becomes really inappropriate to try to name how students have grown because we are missing a point in the data set. And so I think that the thing that I hope that the field understands is that this year's waiver is essentially allowing the, the state to press pause and to have some grace around anything that really relied on and drew on those assessment scores from 2020. Um, so there's some information on our website about those differences, about exactly what is and isn't included. We're going to click today just into the state report card. If you clicked into district or school, you could select any district or school in the state. Um, but all of the report cards have the same format as prior years. You'll notice that there are some places where they state that this data isn't being shared this year because of the waiver. Um, any place where we would in a typical year have data and this year we do not. We are still representing that, showing that to you and then noticing why that data is missing. Um, outside of that, you know, the data is, I would say largely what we expected it to look like. Um, we know that scores have been impacted. We know that attendance has been impacted and we know that these report cards will help us to really identify and evaluate how we move forward from this point. Um, as such, we want to open the floor for questions. We clearly can't show you every report, report card for every school in the state in one quick presentation, but we do want to make sure that if you have any questions for us about the report card, about the data, or about the data that's not there this year, that you have an opportunity for us to respond to those. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Brett, for also moving things around the screen. I appreciate the team effort. I really do. <laughs> the other thing to note that we embargo this for our schools because this is a community discussion as well as a district discussion. And so we did that for a week before even deploying this out uh, transparently to the general public. But any questions you might have of Chris or Brett? One of the things that I do want to add is that we are going to be changing and deploying the state report card early this summer that's going to reflect all of the COVID monies. So if you'll notice per pupil expenditures, that's what's been expended. But we are going to also share what they have in their checking account or in their savings account over all of these dollars to be able to give a, the public a little bit more understanding of the impact of the federal dollars. Chris, anything to share on that? No, just that, um, you know, I think those of you who have worked in schools, you know that the variety of funding sources that you have within your allocations, that you have just within your expenditures, it's incredibly, it's, it's huge, right? From receiving literacy grants to being part of a comprehensive school improvement. There's just many different ways that funding can come. And so we are really looking forward to thinking deeply about how do we represent that on the report card so that communities understand how much money is coming in and also where that money's coming from. What, what is the ESSER recovery impact in your community specifically, but also we'll be then able to potentially share out some other things like what are all the different grants that your school is receiving um, that would be in that same kind of uh, financial analysis. And so we're really looking forward to thinking about how we make the report card more robust in that way. Thank you, Chris. All right, let's move on to our next agenda item.
All right. We've got Mr. Aldina, and I do believe uh, these are some of the very similar slides that we gave to our legislative uh, bodies last week. Zam, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. I will. Thank you, uh, Superintendent, and good morning, everybody. Um, let me just share my screen here. It says, oh, I'll need to um, have access to sharing my screen. Okay, there, I just received it right now. Let me know if you can see my screen right now. Just a straight blue line right down the meridian. <laughs> okay, hold on here. And just let me introduce Zam uh, to, to all, as some may know him. Um, he has been uh, very strategic with um, his company, as well as with the company that is working through the innovation of our licensing system, which will be up and running by uh, June 1. And this is some of the bucket of dollars that came from the previous legislative cycle. And we're really pleased that we are on track. So Zam, I think we're ready. Okay, great. And I'm assuming you can see my screen now with the presentation. We've got gotcha. you. Great, thank you. So, as the um, as the superintendent was saying, we are uh, well in you know uh, in our project of uh, delivering for June one. So, what I'm going to do here is basically talk to you about where we are currently and what needs to occur uh, from now until June first. Uh, so we are working very closely with Randa Solutions, who is a great partner and vendor for uh, the state. They do and have worked with other states on delivering educator uh, licensure systems. And so uh, one of the benefits of working with them is because of their experience working on the business side, as well as uh, being, you know, industry standard leaders in technology uh, as we move forward, you know, being able to work with our business stakeholders, but also um, work with our uh, technology team uh, has been uh, great uh, to Till now and you know we uh, we're on track to meet our June first uh, deadline and so at this point right now from a business requirement standpoint we are about uh, eighty percent complete and what that means is we've sat down and gone through uh, multiple sessions with our business stakeholders from the OPI um, uh, business side and so uh, with what was identified in the RFP as well as what we need to capture for uh, the current state as well for a future state uh, we're about eighty percent complete. And so we're moving along without any risk, uh, without any impediments at this point. And based on our uh, business requirements, we are uh, on track to meet our June 1st deadline. We also are at about 15% of platform configuration. So what that means is as we're collecting the business requirements, uh, uh, Randa is uh, configuring the uh, application. It is not a hard coded uh, application. Therefore, there's a lot of configuration that needs to be, um, uh, that needs to occur, however, uh, we've captured a lot of those business requirements, and right now we do have access to the homepage as well as uh, you know general workflow. And so with that, there's also a training component. So we are we are able to actually show what the new system looks like to our OPI specialist. Uh, within the next week, we're up, we're going to be recording those sessions uh, and then distributing that to uh, the rest of the OPI and um, the state um, uh, stakeholders. And so uh, we're well on our way to meeting the June 1st based on the 15%. In the next uh, month, we are gonna see a lot more uptick in the configuration department and the configuration sector. Uh, uh, work, uh, and so uh, basically within the next month, we should be at about 80% complete on the configuration. And also on the configuration part, there's also the data migration and the data um, component. And so right now we're at 45% complete, which basically means we have a snapshot of the current system uh, and Randa is actually going through the, those um, the data fields and configuring that for the new application. And so uh, in the next month or so, we should see uh, once again, another uptick to about 85% of being that being complete on the data migration side. And one of the more, um, I guess, uh, integral part of this application is the integration with all the other systems and data applications. And right now we're about 35% which basically means we've identified all those areas that we need to connect into and we've identified what those activities are and if there's any risk. And right now we don't have any high level risk for uh, integrating any systems. And so we've identified all those activities that need to happen. And based on that, we are on track for our June 1st uh, deadline. 
one of the integration components uh, is our single sign-on. And so there was initial thought of actually working and moving forward with the state Okta, which is, um, which is their single sign-on uh, technology. Uh, there is another single sign-on activity um, and work, um, this, uh, work stream that, that is occurring right now with the OPI. And so we've identified what that single sign-on is, how to integrate, and uh, identified all the activities. So at this point right now, uh, we are on track uh, with meeting the single sign-on uh, requirement for our June 1st. And once again, putting this all together right now, um, we do have a prototype and training for the next month uh, slated, and we do have a formal training in May, which will be a couple of weeks before we actually implement the system. However, uh, with the configuration of the system, uh, by next week, uh, within a week, week and a half, we'll have a, a prototype of you know, the workflow and the login of the application. And so not only will we record the session, but we'll start distributing this out to all the members. And basically what this means is you'll have access and uh, understanding of what that system would look like. So it really is an informal training process and system that we're using uh, in order to uh, be a lot more uh, familiar with the system before that formal training starts. And so with that, um, you know, I talked about our June 1st, and so we are definitely on track to hit our June 1st uh, deadline. And so what does that mean right now for next steps? Um, and this is a slide basically just, you know, showing exactly where we are, what's uh, happened prior to uh, today. Uh, and as you can see, you know, we're in between the, the February and March uh, timeframe there and June 1st. And so there is the, you know, completion of the data migration. And then I talked about the testing and the training that needs to happen. And then uh, right after that, you know, we're going to be uh, looking to do um, uh, final, uh, final steps in the testing and the uh, configuration of the system so that we do meet that June 1st. So uh, based on our contingency, based on our timelines, uh, we have all our activities laid out and we understand what we need to do, both RANDA and OPI in terms of moving forward. And so for the next steps, we're looking to complete our business requirements in the next, uh, in the next three to four weeks and then integrate the design and so uh, integration of design. So what that basically means is ensuring that we have all those touch points, all those applications and databases that are going to be uh, utilizing, um, you know, the current system and the future system. And then once again, the uh, single sign-on is uh, currently underway right now. And so we're working with the uh, single sign-on team on the IT side and uh, designing and developing that application so that it is integrated within our system. And then I talked about the application demo with the stakeholders. And so that's a big part of what we're planning to do in the next couple of weeks uh, leading up to the formal training for May 6th. Um, and so based on all that, um, like I said, and like the uh, superintendent I talked about, we are on track for June 1st. And, um, you know, we're looking forward to uh, working very diligently like we have been with our stakeholders with Randa. Uh, they're a great partner, a great vendor to work with. And, um, uh, you know, we, we, we have our June 1st, but also at, after that, we do have a maintenance support mechanism in place. Um, and so uh, right now, everything is in line with our baseline. Uh, project plan and uh, you know once again we look forward to uh, implementing this in June. Thank you. Any questions for Zam? I know one of the meetings that we had uh, last week which was really exciting was that the OPI has a virtual teacher learning hub and it was a gift given to the OPI in I believe in 2015 and being able to connect professional development virtually to who we know as a teacher, um, I think is extremely powerful. Always wanting to make sure that we have the most qualified teacher within uh, our public schools, especially those that are teaching our grandchildren. Let's put it that way. Thank you, Zam, very much. Thank you. Let's, let's move on to the next one then. And I thank you for your patience. Normally we try to have these uh, stay for about um, a half hour. So thank you for your patience with us. Let's go on and move into our chapter progress. Uh, Dr. Mergel. Yes, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. So um, I'd like to introduce the facilitator who was confirmed for the negotiated rulemaking for Chapter 55 on accreditation. So Aislinn Brown is the Deputy Bureau Chief um, from the Department of Justice. So Aislinn, would you like to come and introduce yourself to the team? Sure, thank you, Dr. Mergel. Good morning, everyone. I'm Aislinn Brown. Um, I'm a, the Deputy Bureau Chief of Agency Legal Services Bureau, 
And if you haven't heard what that is, it's basically a law firm for the state. We're a state agency that does um, legal work for other state agencies. Um, and so in this case, I was contracted to be a neutral facilitator for the Chapter 55 negotiated rulemaking. Um, so Chapter 55 is all the accreditation standards for public schools in Montana. Um, they sometimes do apply for private schools. And we had the committee meet in person for the first time last week. They met for two days. Um, I'll just be really brief. Um, they looked over some of the definitions that they're going to start reviewing for chapter 55. Um, they'll be getting some suggested changes from a task force that's put together by OPI. And then at the end of the process in June, after several in-person and multiple Zoom meetings, they will put together a final report and an economic impact statement for the superintendent to then bring to the Board of Public Education. So we got work started on that. Um, it's an exciting process and it is all publicly um, televised on the legislature's website. So if anybody wants to watch, you can do that. And there also is opportunity for public comment at each session. Did I get everything? <laughs> Good job, Dr. Merkel. <laughs> Thank you, Isla, Thank and you. I really appreciate it. So um, the task force for Chapter 55 that um, Isla just mentioned is under work and actually meeting today here at 11 for a two-hour Zoom meeting and working diligently on some conceptual changes and initial recommendations to bring forward uh, to the superintendent. We have an in-person meeting in April as well. Um, and so that is going really um, well, and the groups are working together, and again, all that information information is available on the OPI website where you can find the minutes, the summaries, the recordings. You can see the different documents that the group is working on. And all of those task force sessions are also available publicly for you to, to join and listen in and provide public comment during those sessions. Um, and so moving into chapter 57 uh, for licensing, uh, that is still um, under public comment. Uh, the Board of Public Ed is still receiving public comment until April 8th for any of the recommended uh, changes to licensing from the superintendent. Um, and that will be going to the board for a final vote on the decision of what those rules will be in May at their May meeting. Um, for our chapter 58, that group right now, uh, we have a group uh, of subcommittees <coughs> assigned different endorsements for chapter 58, which is part of the different uh, like in teaching math and teaching, uh, you know, science and social studies. And so we had a group that needed a little bit more time there to kind of work on those endorsement areas. They're going to be finished with their work on April 1st. We've sent out an invite and uh, I'm doing a doodle poll to figure out the best time to really bring that group together for a two person meeting here in Helena to finalize their work. Um, so we will be doing that. Uh, last month in March at the Board of Public Ed meeting, it was uh, requested by the Board of Public Ed and they approved to extend the timeline for Chapter 58, uh, bringing forward those recommendations in July of this summer. So that's kind of what's happening with the three different chapters as they are moving forward. Excellent. Thank you. Any questions you might have on 55, 57, or 58? Superintendent, I did just want to add one thing. Um, the Board of Public Ed is actually hosting a special board meeting on April 28th as well. That's where the board will um, be responding to comments that we've received. Uh, Dr. Mergel's right that ultimately the vote will be in May, but I did want to uh, make folks aware on this call that there will be an April 28th meeting as well. Thank you, McCall. Anything else on these? We do have on our webpage uh, lots of access. If there's any questions, please share with anyone within the field or your community. I do want to walk back up uh, after um, we had the presentation on all the budgets and things. There is an A, B, C, and D here. So let's just go into the data collection. Wendy, if you want to just share real quick what's going on with the data that finalized and, and ended that we requested of our schools uh, March 18th. So, if you so could. I think all of you are aware we've been collecting data that was required as part of our ESSER grant, ESSER and grants um, from the feds, and we've been reaching out to all the school districts to gather that information. It's gone very well. It's, it's been a challenge. We broke it into six different um, red tabs, and, and people have been referring to those and working through them diligently. 
Um, we're going to be spending the next week really looking at those drawbacks and synthesizing that, seeing what areas we see as potential areas of risk and reaching back to those districts individually to say, can we get some clarification? So we're really partnering with the districts on this data collection and making sure that it's nice and clean before we go ahead and submit it as a final uh, report in. So we're continuing to work on that project. We've got about 60 schools right now that are still in the com in completing several different stages. So we're working with them on completing it. Um, they've been great. They've been working diligently on it and appreciate the support as we go through. Exactly. And this is something that we've never collected before. And I mean, it is, if you haven't opened up and looked at it, it's also on our website, it is 52 pages of lots and lots of questions. And I'm really appreciative that our staff went ahead, as Wendy had said, and broke it up into six different tabs so that um, they can do this in a meaningful manner and that it doesn't seem like it's a huge tsunami that's come. But nevertheless, for our very rural schools, uh, because this collection is for every single school in Montana, that uh, this has been quite a challenge and we're here to serve and here to help. And as you just said, 60 schools are just attempting to cross that finish line and we're here to work with them. So Dr. Mergel, gonna have you go to the mode of instruction and the LEA plans. Yes, thank you, Superintendent. So as per the Montana State ARP ESSER plan, uh, Montana agreed to collect data on the student level for mode of instruction. And mode of instruction means whether the students are receiving their instruction in person, in a hybrid model, or remotely. And so back in the fall, we opened up a window within the AIM tool to try to place that in a location that would be, make most sense for our school districts. Um, and so that data was collected collected in the fall. Um, it will be viewed again in a snapshot taken here um, in April uh, through May. And so we're just encouraging districts to continue to go in there and keep their records updated as maybe the status of the students have changed. So for example, maybe a student who was receiving their instruction remotely the first semester, that potentially might have changed and maybe they've made the decision to come back in, in person. Um, we just want to encourage districts to be sure that they're going in and continuously updating any of those changes. And as we know, the majority of our schools in Montana have been receiving instruction in person uh, throughout the year, but there is a percentage of students that have been participating in remote learning and even fewer in a hybrid model. So we just want to continue to encourage our districts and our AIM users at our districts that um, input that data to continuously upload that uh, mode of instruction and uh, let us know if they have have any questions because we do have tools and visuals on how to do that and how to keep that current. Thank you. And the LEA plans? Every six months, right? <laughs> Every six months. So yes, so the um, LEA plans for our district ARP plans, uh, most of our schools implemented those in August. And so the requirement from the department is that they need to be updated at a minimum of six months and with stakeholder engagement. And so if we're counting our six months, uh, February would have been the six months. So we just wanna be sure if any of our school districts um, have not made any changes to their plans that they need to go in and do that. That would be very few because we did provide feedback to our school districts on the plans and many of them took advantage of the opportunity at that time mm -hmm. to update them in November. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, again, if there was somebody maybe who didn't have any updates that they needed to do, do need to continually go in and refresh at a minimum every six months. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Mergel. Well, that concludes. If there's any questions of us, would like to uh, have a moment if you have any questions of the OPI or our staff that's here or anything that we can get back to you. Well, I thank you very much. I know there's a lot of work that's, that's happening. Our assessment windows are open. We um, are <laughs> engaged in a lot of things here at the OPI and uh, we need partners and we need an understanding of how we can serve our students and more importantly, on learning. If you have any questions of us, we are here. Uh, information will be flowing after this meeting of all the documents that you saw on your screen, and I wish everyone well. Blessings, thank you.